Um, expectations are an interesting thing. Um, any of you who have, you know, been around uh, for any length of time, if you've walked into a situation uh, where you weren't quite sure what was going to happen, uh, you, you, you may have had things built up in your head like this is what I think happens when we do this and then you walk into something and maybe those expectations don't necessarily uh, work its way out. I think church is like that sometimes. I, I think we all kind of come to church and we have at least to some degree built up expectations of one way or another that this is what's supposed to happen in worship and this is how I'm supposed to be treated and here's how I'm supposed to interact with people and this is what is you know if especially if we get to a text that we've heard before if we see a scripture that oh yeah we've seen a guy preach this one before or we've studied this one before so this is what we're supposed to teach about this or that or all those types of different things and sometimes those expectations are met and sometimes they're not there are also times where you walk into situations and you have all sorts of expectations about what's going to happen and what takes place is nowhere near what you thought was coming. And sometimes that's good and sometimes that's not so good. I uh, have been formed to just basically expect the unexpected after having now been married for almost 15 years and I have two kids. It, you, just, you just never know. You know, you wake up in the mornings, you have no idea. I uh, remember even before we started this journey with children, I, my wife had two C-sections. What an experience, yeah. And I didn't do anything except see the grossness, you know, just to be honest. There was at one point in the midst of this, and I promise you, there are certain things there's, first of all, let me just say this. There are things they should tell you ahead of time. For them not to tell you, it's like they're messing with you. They... They should have told you certain things, like don't look over the curtain, you know, because you will see the insides of a person. And no one should see that. I grew up in a house my dad loved to watch, like, surgeries and stuff, and he's weird, okay? I'm like, why would you want to see that? My wife struggled with uh, real uh, bad high blood pressure throughout all of her pregnancy, especially towards the end. And I remember when we got Harper for the very first time, and one no baby looks cute right out of the womb. They all look like little greased monkeys. Something is wrong, okay? But there was this moment where they clamp her umbilical cord, and the next thing I know, I'm looking over at Heather because I, I'm, she's doing fine, and I'm terrified the whole time, completely racked with nerves, and I'm just staring at her face because I'm like, I can't look over the curtain. I can't look over the curtain, you know. I'd already done it once. I was like, I'm not doing it again. And she's just laughing at me. Um, and the next thing we know, like, blood is literally raining down on top of us. It hit her in the face. It hit me in the side of the head, and we're like, what is happening? Of course, Heather's feeling fine. You know, she's, she's got, had the epidural. She doesn't know what's going on. You know, she's just happy to be there. Um, and I'm complete, like, what is happening? And I hear our doctor say, oops. <laughs> what happened? Who does that in a surgery? Only a jerk does that in a surgery, by the way. A horrible person does that. And I was said, what is happening? And she goes, oh, the clamp slipped off the umbilical cord. It happens all the time. Feel free to share that, you know, ahead of time. I remember walking out of, walking out of the operating room, and Heather's fine. Everything is okay. And my mother-in-law is a nurse. And she was a cardiac nurse for a while. That's what she still does. And I walk out, and the look on her face was even like, oh, my. Because the husband is not supposed to walk out with blood on him. She's like, what happened? And I said, well, the clamp slipped off the umbilical cord. And she goes, oh, yeah, it happens all the time. I'm like, <laughs> when were y'all going to tell us? You know? But you walk into all sorts of things in your lives, and we have these expectations like, this is what's supposed to happen here. I was not expecting blood on me when I left my daughter's birth. I didn't know what to expect, but that was not one of them, you know? But I think we walk into church and we begin looking at one another and we begin looking at this is what church is supposed to be. And I'm not going to lie, if you've been in church for any length of time, people don't live up to your expectations. They fail. Churches fail your expectations. They fail my expectations. And you begin to take a step back, and I think the biggest question that needs to be asked, and I think Paul does this really, really well for us, is we begin to make our way through Ephesians. 
is that maybe, just maybe, we need to take a step back from our expectations. We may need, maybe need to reassess. It's one thing to hold the church to a high standard. It's, it's quite another to completely forget that the church is full of a bunch of broken people. I want to give you a a little bit of a preface to the book of Ephesians because this is a really, really interesting book that has all sorts of kind of, all sorts of facets that are kind of coming together as we get this book. Because as Paul writes this book, he's actually in Rome and he is in prison. And this is where we get Philippians. It's where we get, while he's in prison, it's where we get Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, and possibly maybe a couple of the others. But he is in prison, probably under house arrest of some sort because he's getting a chance to communicate with others and to write. History tells us that this is eventually where Paul, will, Paul will, where Paul will be martyred. One of the things we know about Paul's relationship to the church at Ephesus is that it was extremely close. In fact, at one point when Paul has to leave after staying there for three years of ministry, he weeps with the elders of the church because it is such a traumatic event for him to have to go. The letter itself is pretty interesting just simply because in the New Testament, as we look at every single one of the epistles that are written to churches, this is the only one that is written not about specific issues or specific people and problems within the church. Every other one mentions people or major struggles that this church is working through or maybe just failing at. And yet at the same time, If you can read through 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, Ephesus is a church also struggling with some major, major issues. We'll come back to the implications of that here in just a little bit. But because this letter was written with basically this, here is church life as Christ is hoping, as Christ is moving, this letter was copied and transcribed multiple times and then passed along to all sorts of other congregations simply because of the message that comes from it. But Ephesians itself takes place in the midst of a city that is also incredibly interesting. It's a metropolitan area, and it had, it, Ephesus had considerable influence upon the entire region. Many of us will have heard the term, the seven wonders of the world. Well, one of those was here in Ephesus, the Temple of Artemis. And the Temple of Artemis was the primary, well, it, it basically dictated the entirety of the city. It did everything. Businesses were built based upon it being in the city. People were employed. The entire socioeconomic status of the city was driven by this pagan religion, the Temple of Artemis. And I'm not going to go too far into that. When I preach through First and Second Timothy at some point, I will give you a much bigger feel on what's actually taking place here. The challenges for this early group of Christians, this group of young Christians, are quite significant. They were the new religion on the block, constantly living in the shadows of this temple of Artemis. Their belief in Jesus was a major threat to the city, not just to the religion. Like I mentioned, the entire economics of the city, the entire identity of the city was built upon this other religion. And it's not just that, but one of the things that that kind of would come to, well, it would come to fruition, is if the people of Ephesus walked away from the temple of Artemis, everything would come crashing down. And not to mention this early group of Christians are really baby Christians in many ways because what had happened by the time we get to the 50s, late 50s, early 60s of what's taking place here in the first century is that now many of these Christian churches are full of Gentiles and they're not driven by their Jewish counterparts. So we have a lot of baby Christians gathering together with very little history in Jesus, very little understanding of God's continued work throughout the generations of the world. And they are having to look across the street at this monument that drives the entire city. Being in church during these early years was very much a difficult task. 
very much a difficult situation. So I want to read for you Genesis, uh, I want to read for you Ephesians chapter 1. Hear these words from Paul. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. In him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with the wisdom, with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time, to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and the things on earth in him. In him we have also received an inheritance, because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will, so that we, who had already put our hope in Christ, might bring praise to his glory. In him you also, when you heard of the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you also believed, were sealed in him with the promised Holy Spirit. He is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the, of the possession to the praise of his glory. This is why, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I never stop giving thanks to you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength. He exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. I know sometimes we have a tendency to only want to read two or three verses here or there and kind of dissect that, but I want to give you the gravity of Ephesians chapter 1. Because there's a ton going on here. And Paul, and one of, one of the things that is so interesting about this text is the way that Paul comes forth with such excitement about who Christ is. About what Christ is doing in his church and about what Christ has meant for the entirety of the universe. This is a manifesto, a declaration about God's love, about all the things that God is accomplishing. And for Paul, the only way for you and I to understand our story is inside of the grand story. That outside of the grand story, there's no way for us to understand who we are. He wants the Ephesians, he wants us, I think, to be blown away by the goodness of God. I wrestled with that this week. When's the last time I was blown away by the goodness of God? That alone is worth the contemplation of Ephesians chapter 1. When is the last time that you looked at God and you were so overwhelmed that if you begin to look at the way that he writes, he just keeps coming up with adjective after adjective that seem to just take it higher and higher and higher and higher until finally it's like Paul ran out of great things to say. And one of the great understandings that we get from Paul in this about Jesus and about his church is that he is the head of the church, that it is his body, and that they are seemingly, Christ and his church, one entity. Which is interesting because in our culture today, we keep trying to separate Jesus from his church. I'm a Christian, but I don't want to be a part of the church. I don't want to go to church, or I don't want to do that type of a thing. And we keep trying to tear those two things apart. And when you look at Scripture, 
He's constantly trying to show us that these are together. They go hand in hand. Eugene Peterson, one of the guys I like to read on a pretty regular basis, makes this really, really beautiful statement about the church. That the church is God's heavenly colony in a country of death. That the church is this colony birthed miraculously from the Spirit of God, brought right out of the throne room of God, and placed in the midst of a country of death in a world that seems only to choose itself. But if you want to see heaven come to earth, look no further than the church. That the church is the Holy Spirit's core strategy for showing the world who Christ is. That our existence as Christians is not an attack upon the world, but a loving embrace of it. This is what God chose us for. It's why we've been gathered in Christ. It's why Christ has lavished grace upon us. Here's the thing, because one of the, 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 the temptations that I think tends to move its way in is this prideful conversation about, that's right, this is who we are. We got it right, and if you're not in church, you don't. And yet, the primary actor within the world, the primary actor within every single one of our lives is not us. Anything good comes from him. By becoming a Christian, in being a Christian, from the moment of your salvation to every single day that you walk this earth, life is completely dependent upon Christ what he has done, and what he is continuing to do. Jesus Christ, if you want to write something down today, write this down. Jesus Christ is the source, the sustainer, and the goal of life. All of them. The source, the sustainer, and the goal. This is why Paul can say that the Holy Spirit, what God is doing, is our identifying marker, our guarantee for eternal life. And you notice the, the gifts that are given down. They all come from outside of us. He prays that we would receive God's wisdom and revelation, that our hearts would be enlightened with a kingdom perspective, and that the hope in Christ and for his will would reign in us. Paul prays that we would receive, we would receive our identity and purpose as God's children and all the riches that come with that inheritance, that we would live through the full experience of God's power. That language in Ephesians from Paul can make the church kind of sound like a utopian group of people, you know? Because I, I feel like as he continues to make his way through, he goes overboard with being positive, and I keep waiting for Paul to, to kind of drop the next shoe, which is to say, in the midst of all of this, look how messed up our churches are, you know? Because the craziest thing and the most broken thing about the church is people, you know? And we can put all sorts of things on when it comes to worship, and we can do all sorts of, of, of stuff up here, but as we begin to dig deeper and deeper and deeper into the lives of people, the next thing you know, you come to realize we're all pretty messed up. So how do we hold the victory of Jesus, what God has accomplished through the resurrection and the ascension and the same conversation and intention with all the evils that we see within our world and, to be honest, even within our own lives? Because if we're honest, the church doesn't seem to have made a lot of headway in the world today. You know? And I think for many of us, that just... I'm the fixer, I, I'm a, that's who I am, I'm a fixer by nature, and I look at broken things and I want to fix it, and I want to tell people, do this to figure things out. I want it to be better. And you begin to look at the way that the world works today, and it doesn't seem like we've made much ground, and it sure doesn't seem like we've eliminated a lot of evil within the world today. And maybe Paul was right when he just said, we're inventors of evil. We just come, keep coming up in our broken world today. We just keep coming up with new things to sin, new ways to sin. I mean, even in our local churches, we struggle with personal agendas, leadership vacuums, 
helping people find real freedom from their demons? How can we see an apostle who seems so positive about the church and all that Christ has accomplished and yet see so much pain and brokenness? I think this is where it comes back to expectations that may not line up with the way God wants things in his church, and just to be honest, maybe our expectations really are a little bit unscriptural. See, God gave us the church as a gift through the Holy Spirit. And if you go back and you look at the people in which he picked, he did not pick the best of the best. He picked a bunch of blue-collar, paycheck-to-paycheck type guys who weren't very highly educated, and he called them to go do ministry before he put them through seminary, you know? Every church is riddled with brokenness, with people who are battling their own demons and sins, and inside that community, a lot of us are going through a lot of big-time growing pains. For every leap of faith and newfound insight, it seems like somebody or maybe even a church leader falls to adultery, pornography, addictions, gossip, gluttony, arrogance, sexual abuse, and self-righteousness. And yet, hear this this morning. These are the very people Paul calls saints. Think about that for just a second. Paul uses the term saint three times in the first chapter and nine times in six chapters, which concludes the entire book. Saint literally means holy ones. These, these are the holy ones. Isn't that interesting? Because if I were to call you a saint, or you were to call me a saint, most of us would take a step back and we would go, whoa, 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 I'm, I'm no saint. Please don't hold me to that high of a standard. In fact, for most of us, the only place we even see the word saint used today is from the Catholic Church when somebody dies. And even then, sometimes it takes decades after a person dies before we make them a saint. Because it's like we've romanticized it enough several years down the road, we're like, eh, okay, let's make them one now, you know? And for many of us, we may hear the term saint used at a funeral because they've gone on to join the saints, but we sure don't think of ourselves that way. And even more so because we know some of the brokenness within our neighbor, we don't want to call them a saint either. Like, I know they're junk. Saints know one thing, though. Saints know that the only thing good in them is Christ Jesus. That the only thing good in their life is what he has done, and it's, what's, it's what he's doing. Saints don't boast about anything because they know that their achievement has come simply because of the Holy Spirit at work within them. See, saint implies a complete submission and a humility in following Jesus, and yet at the same time, that sounds like a paradox because I don't know that any of us come to complete submission. This is why the church can be such a mixed bag of broken people, held together simply because God is gracious. So let me ask you a couple questions here regarding the expectations that you come to church with. Maybe the expectations that your neighbors have or your friends have. Because let's just be honest, in a city like Lubbock, and we're going to talk about this, if you're not coming to a connection class when this is over, I encourage you to come to one because this is what we're going to be discussing across the hallway in the gym. The Lubbock community and Lubbock culture is a very interesting one. We do have people coming in from outside of our community, and we do have people within our community who are atheists and people who worship other religions and all sorts of other things, but a huge, the vast majority of the Lubbock culture are people who identify with Christianity but don't want to identify with this church. 
That's our culture. That's Lubbock. And for many of them, they have broken expectations of what the world is supposed to be and what the church is supposed to look like within that world. And no offense, we don't help with that sometimes because we put on the show like we've got it all together and maybe, just maybe, God put a bunch of broken people together for a reason. Because maybe the perfect condition for growing up in Jesus is to be in community with a bunch of broken people who are trying to figure out how to grow up in Jesus. That somewhere in the midst of you and I dealing with our stuff and our sin and our pain and our hurt, and as we work to reveal ourselves to one another so that we can try to figure out community, maybe, just maybe, that's the exact condition. Maybe God knows what he's doing after all. Because I promise you this, you wouldn't put this group of people together if everybody was holding a sign over their head that said, this is my junk. I mean, you might go, well, we'll take, it'd be like a draft, you know. (laughs) We'll take, yeah, nope, yep, you're out, sorry. We don't want that one in ours. And yet within our churches today, that's exactly what seems to be taking place because the minute somebody reveals something, we're like, all right, like we know church is a place for brokenness, but you ain't got to share all that. And yet, this is the gift from God, and one of the things that I love so much about the way that Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of my favorite people in the world, favorite theologians ever, he talks about this, that the church is a gift, and the person that loves their vision of what the church should be ends up destroying the church. Because no one's going to live up to your expectations of what the church should be. We don't choose Christian community. I mean, I know in Lubbock, you probably, who knows how many churches you drove past to get here this morning. But God chooses our Christian community. Christian community. And you remember the words of Paul that in the midst of this broken group, this mixed bag of people who have so many issues and so many struggles, we see Paul say exactly that in the midst of this, Christ has blessed us, chosen us, predestined us, lavished his grace upon us, made his plan known to us, and he is bringing all things together under his reign. And so I say again, Jesus Christ is the source, the sustainer, and the goal of all of life. Only in Christ will we be transformed, and that term, in Christ, you will see almost 200 or more than 200 times, depending upon the translation, almost or over 200 times in all of Paul's writings, in Christ, because everything is in Christ. So here's your challenge for the week. Here's the so what. First, each of us have to figure out and continue to figure out and to discern on a daily basis, what does it look like for me to surrender and for Christ to be active in my life? How do I surrender so that Christ can be active? How do I give up my agenda so his works through me and he goes forth and he does his thing? This is how we have good marriages. This is how we parent through the Spirit of God. How do I surrender so that Christ's agenda can go forward? This is how we deal with broken Christians, people who have hurt us. How do I surrender? Because the beauty of what we see on display from Paul is he's loving this church, not because of what he wants them to be, but because of who God says they are. That is a challenge to you and I, to love one another, to love Christians, to love people because of who God says they are, not who we want them to be. That's what real love looks like. And the second thing, I think it's on us to help someone connect to the church.
people are becoming completely disillusioned with church. And I think it's on the church to remind the world that we aren't saints because of anything that we've done well. We are saints because of this Christ who offers us love and we just say, yes, please, we'll take it. That's what makes us saints. So there's several things for us to wrestle with from that. But I want to end with the prayer that Paul gave us. So what I would like for you to do is to close your eyes and to hear this prayer. I invite the band to come back up. But hear this prayer this morning. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength. Father, we surrender ourselves to you. And we know that it is you that makes us good. Father, may we be completely blown away by your goodness. May we be more than happy to accept your goodness as our own. Father, give us a yearning to witness to the beauty of the church, a collection of broken people who are finding healing in their Savior. Give us the courage to speak about it, to share with others. And may we do everything through Jesus, your Son. It is through him that we even speak to you. Amen.